Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's wonderful to see all of you here. Um, a couple of years ago, in 2019, I organized a conference in this very building, but I didn't, give, didn't get to give a talk. So today is actually the first time that, uh, that I'm going to talk to you in this beautiful room, and thanks a lot for the GoTo organization for inviting me. Um, as, as mentioned, I'm going to talk about the last decades in data management, and it's kind of inspired by this Bill Bryson book, A Short History of Nearly Everything, where you're trying to give a not-so-serious overview about, about like a lot of stuff that happened in a long time. So uh, if I forget something that you think is extremely important, come up to me uh, afterwards. Um, a bit about myself. I've been doing this for a while. This is my actual license plate from uh, 2002. Um, and uh, as you can probably tell, I already liked data management systems back then. <laughs> Uh, now I, I live here, I've been living here for a while, I don't have this anymore, but uh, I started out in life as a MySQL developer. Um, these days, uh, as mentioned, uh, I do research and teaching, but my, my main occupation is working on DuckDB, and I'm one of the creators of DuckDB, but I'm also the co-founder and CEO of DuckDB Labs, a company that provides services and support around DuckDB. Very briefly about DuckDB. Who here has heard about DuckDB? Show of hands. Okay, great. Now everybody can raise their hand because now you've heard of it. Um, so DuckDB is the system that we're working on. It's uh, pretty exciting. It's a new in-process SQL data management system, free and open source, and has a new architecture, as I mentioned. It's in process. Actually, there's some interesting news. Just last week, we had our 1.0 release after six years of hard work, so I'm very glad about that. Uh, we had DuckDB 1.0 coming out finally. And for some reason, it is currently trending on Hacker News. Now, how often can you say this, that your project is trending while you're giving the talk? Huh? It's nice. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And if you want to hear more about this, there's going to be a talk tomorrow uh, at the same time. No, in, in one hour later, at 14.30. Uh, in the filing shell uh, from my colleague Gabo, who is going to tell you all about this. But this talk is not about that. Um, I'm going to sp start about the last decades, but I thought, why decades, right? Why, let's not, why, we can also just go back a couple of centuries. There's no issue with that, because data management systems actually have been around for a very long time. And please forgive the you know, boomer uh, sort of AI-generated pictures over there. It's the I just had some fun uh, some late at night. So this is clearly an ancient data management system. But it's actually not so crazy, because the first table that we have, have you seen this? I have a talk that talks about clay tablets the same way. <laughs> Excellent. More clay tablets in data management. So this is actually a clay tablet that was excavated uh, in Uruk, which is in Iraq, uh, from about 5,000 years ago. Um, and it, is, it shows a table. Uh, and the, um, the, what the table, the content of the table has been decoded, thankfully. It shows amounts of hop and uh, barley, which uh, one can only guess what they're trying to keep track of here. Um, but the cool thing about this clay tablet is that record keeping actually predates literature by about a thousand years. Okay? The first tables that we have are about a thousand years older than the first texts that we have. So it's really interesting, and of course it makes me very happy as somebody who loves tables, uh, that, that this is such an ancient art. I actually didn't know about this until very recently. But when we talk about the history of tables, we have to mention uh, IBM. Uh, they did groundbreaking work on um, data management systems back way back when, and now we're com coming to this century, and I will talk to you through sort of the rough history uh, of, these, of these systems, because I think it's really cool. Why IBM? Well, they were the first big company that kind of had data management as their sort of goal, as their business-making, money-making thing. But the cool thing is that this, the beginning of data management systems actually was the space program, believe it or not, because the Americans, they built this moon rocket, and they had to somehow keep track of all the parts of said moon rocket. And as you can imagine, together with all the bits and pieces, you know, the rover, the little thing, the antennas, everything that goes into the moon rocket, um, it was quite an interesting task to keep track of all these parts. And just for the parts management of the moon rocket, they gave IBM a giant you know, amount of money and be like, you, you invent the first digital data management systems. And IBM did. Um, 
and in uh, the, the, pro, the, the, the system was first installed in 1968 uh, at NASA on the IBM 360. Uh, this is what the IBM 360 looks like. Uh, I just love how dignified computing used to be. <laughs> right now we have some guys' laptop like smeared with cola or whatever, you know. But, oh no, you know, this guy is wearing a suit. <laughs> it's like, I don't know, I just, I just, I just it's, it boggles the mind how we changed in terms of um, the relationship with digital things. And I think it's a good thing, right? It's much more sort of widespread. Um, IBM then turned around and started selling the system that they've built um, to, the, to the mass market, the, first world's the world's first commercial data management system uh, called uh, IMS, the Information Control System and Data Language Slash Interface. This is a good reminder that computer scientists shouldn't be asked to name things. <laughs> right? Leave that to the marketing department. Uh, it was very quickly renamed to IMS, the Information Management System, much better. Uh, and was sold, uh, was a big success. Apparently, it's still used a lot in, in banks. Well, I'm told banks, of course, being conservative people. Um, but what's interesting about this thing is that it had a hi hierarchical sort of setup. So you had to define the access path by which you access information in that system. So you could only say, okay, I'm going to have, I don't know, um, contracts in the system, but they are organized by customer, and the customers are organized by country, and the, I don't know, something like that. And that meant that you, in order to get, let's say, all the contracts, you first had to go through all the countries, get all the customers for each country, and then had to get all the contracts for each customer for each country. And that meant that, yeah, the access path wasn't free. Like, you had to always go through this one access path, which is why this is called a hierarchical data management system. So this was 68, remember? But then only two years later, this seminal paper came out from uh, Edgar Codd, who wrote the... Um, the, the paper about the relational model, right? Big revolution. Suddenly, we didn't have the restriction anymore for the access paths. Instead, we could access data in whichever way we saw fit. We could say, today I'm looking at the contracts table, and tomorrow I'm going to look at the customers table, and I don't have to go through this like dance of going down. So this was a big revolution, the relational model. Um, and then we had this quick progression of uh, commercial systems coming out, actually not so commercial sometimes. Um, so 73. Uh, system R was the first IBM system that implemented this model, so it took them about three years to, to get this right. Um, 79, the, the biggest sort of corporate failure before uh, Google's failure in AI was uh, IBM basically losing the go-to-market to Oracle. <laughs> this is the reason we have Oracle in the first place, right? Because basically IBM invented this relational model, then spent three years on building this prototype, but it took them until 83, until the first sort of big commercial data management system from IBM came out. In the meantime, Oracle had beaten them by four years, and uh, this is the reason this is still a big company, right? Um, I've also added uh, 96 Postgres here because, uh, yeah, this is a system many people will know. M not so many people will know that this was started as an academic research project at the University of California at Berkeley. And there's people that spend their entire lives, okay, this is an exaggeration, I actually know the person. There is somebody that spent a lot of time, with Felix Naumann from the uh, HPE in Potsdam, that made this um, picture that shows you the sort of the family tree of data, of relational systems. And you can see this is pretty wild, but if I can, I can give you sort of a high level overview of it. On the left side here, we have sort of the primordial soup of data systems, which is regrettably in California. Um, and then there's all these systems that sort of come up and they merge and they fork and they merge and they fork, but they all come up to the sort of the present day over here. And what you can kind of see from that is that these lines, they kind of go through very sort of in a straight way if you squint a bit. And that's actually a real thing that you can see there because data management systems never die, right? Once something is entrenched, DB2 is still going strong, Oracle is still going strong, Postgres, you know, Huge hype for some reason. Um, why are you laughing at this? <laughs> I still, I, I honestly don't get it. But um, uh, anyways, the, um, the systems, they're here to stay because they're so fundamental pieces of technology. Once you build something like a country or, uh, you know, a military or, <laughs> I don't know, a big uh, company on top of any of these systems, you're never going to get rid of them. They're that fundamental. Um, but moving on with 
the sort of the general genealogy or the general sort of history. So we had, up until this point, we had relational systems with SQL that were doing transactions. Uh, basically, the use case that if you've ever been in a, um, a lecture on data management systems at university, may, I have been in a couple, but you, maybe you have as well, th you always have this one use case where you talk about, we'll move money from this account to that account. Who has seen this slide with this use case? Okay, I would say about a third of you. So this is the transactional use case. This is this traditional data systems use case. And all these systems, and, all, and in many of the successors that are in this picture, they were implementing essentially that, we call it a transactional use case, where you have tables, yes. You have SQL, yes. But you are kind of, you're kind of following this general pattern of moving money around. Obviously, it's not limited to moving money around. But it's very similar, right? You, you add a line, you add a row to a record to your tables, you add another record, you update them, you delete them. These are like very table-oriented, very, very sort of row-oriented sort of interactions. Um, so next step was that people started to think, well, maybe we have more use cases for data management systems than just um, this transactional use case, right? Maybe there's more to the world than moving money from one account to another. And I think this is interesting because the relational model as defined by COD uh, doesn't actually say that you have to have a transactional use case. It just talks about relations, about tables, about a way to manipulate them. Later, you know, the language SQL, Don Chamberlain, they, they, they added this language on top. But nowhere did it say that you had to use it for this traditional bank use case. And that's exactly what then happened. People started to innovate within this model of the relational sort of world, right? Where we um, st started to see different kinds of data management systems. And this is kind of summarized under this one size fits all, which was a famous um, and controversial publication from uh, Mike Stonebreaker, who is, by the way, the creator of Postgres. Um, who got a Turing Award for this, which is, I think, the highest uh, honor that you can get as a computer scientist, which, uh, you know, I'm still, still bummed that we can't do Nobel Prizes, but there we go. Um, so, Stonebreaker got his Turing Award, and he wrote this paper about one-size-fits-all data systems, where we basically started seeing innovation within the relational sphere, right? Um, so people took the, the basic abstractions, tables, SQL, you know, uh, and, and b started building other systems. And the biggest sort of uh, differences in sort of, uh, there's like, how should I say this best? A bunch of interesting systems came up that were different from the transactional use cases. And the biggest sort of camp, two camps that emerged were the um, transactional and analytical camps, right? There were people that were doing the traditional transactions. It's still, you know, still very valid use case. But there was also a growing camp of people doing analytics. And here's a picture that shows you kind of the, the, um, the technical um, and philosophical sort of problem when you're trying to merge different use cases uh, under, one uh, one, under one sort of physical representation. So basically, on the left here, we have our transactional systems. As I said, you know, the original sort of IBM, DB2, Oracle kind of layout where we take a table here. Let's say we have a table with four columns, has four rows in it. And we organize them physically on disk according to their uh, row association. So in this case, we would say we'll store the first row first, then, we'll start, then behind that we'll put the second row, third row, and so on. And that works really well for transactional systems because you tend to update multiple columns in the same row, you tend to insert individual rows, you tend to delete individual rows. It works really well. You, you basically put everything into a, into a B-tree, which is a data structure that I think almost all transactional systems out there, uh, at least the serious ones, implement. It's a hierarchical sort of representation of data that um, amortizes the disk access latency very well. Um, so all, this is all well. And actually, it's uh, fundam fundamentally a problem. How do you turn a two-dimensional structure like a table into a one-dimensional file on a storage medium, right? It's not, there's, not, there's, not a, there's not sort of an obvious way to do it. Well, the row-wise one is one. But then it turns out that for analytical systems, systems that are supposed to process large amounts of data, um, 
you know, for creating reports, creating statistical derivation, analytics, right? You're reading through the entire table, you're creating aggregates. Some, in, the, in the past, people sometimes called this OLAP, but you may have heard the term. These systems, they can actually work much better if you have a columnar representation. So this is a problem, right? Now we have something that you can do very well with data management systems, which is this analytical stuff, but the data representation that you need to do this fast is actually in direct conflict with the data structure that you need to do the transactional case well. So for the reason this is so is for columns, for analytical systems, we want to put stuff into columns, which means we put all the data belonging to one column together. And this is great because that means we can skip columns that we're not interested in. This is very difficult in the robust system. Um, we can have very nice compression because we are compressing things from the same sort of distribution together. And we have um, very good sort of computational efficiency when we're going through these things. But now again, we have two sort of competing use cases in the same abstraction. These are both relational systems with both tables. They have both, um, you know, a SQL in front of it. Um, so this was the first split in data systems, I think. The first big split was between analytical and transactional systems. And now we see actually two different camps of systems that are within the relational model, which one is a transactional one, and then we have the, the analytical ones. It's an interesting, it's a sort of important sort of schism in, in systems is that we have these two different competing use cases. And there's very good technical reasons for it, as I've explained. It's very difficult to get these things fast for uh, the, the row representation fast analytical use cases. It's very different to, difficult to get the analytical representation, the column rep representation fast for transactional use cases. But there's also a, um, a sort of trust issue, right? Like I've, I've tr me being German, of course, I explain everything with cars. Uh, this is, uh, um, there's also a trust issue. If you're, I've, as I mentioned earlier, if you're building a transactional system, you are essentially betting your civilization's future on that thing not losing your data, right? You want something like this. Not, I'm not paid by Toyota, but you want the Hilux, right? It's famously, it's famously rugged, it will never die, it will just continue. Um, and this is great for your transactional system. So you really want something that will be rugged and, and which means that there is a high cost for people to, like a high personal cost for people to risk something new in transactions, right? If you have your bank and you're the guy that says, hey, let's, let's use this different data management system. I've heard of this cool new thing. And then it crashes the next month and leaves everything is gone. Uh, you are in big trouble. On the analytical side, however, there's a bit more wiggle room. There we care a lot about performance, right? We care a lot about um, getting through a lot of data in a very short time. So you kind of want something like a Formula One car, which is very, very fast. But if it doesn't work all the time, well, it's not the end of the world because it's usually not the system of record, as we call it, right? We have no, like we, our business is not essentially grinding to a halt if your analytical database doesn't start. And because of this market sort of force, um, we have seen a lot of stuff happening in the analytical space. It's no accident that, you know, our system, DuckDB, is an analytical system because it means, because it, it, there's much less sort of uh, inhibition for people to, to use these things because, that, as I said, transactional things, you just want to Toyota and then you're happy. But so far, I've been talking about this sort of people innovating inside the relational model, which, you know, consists of rows and columns. Um, next, I want to talk about innovating outside the model. Uh, so, as you know, there was something called NoSQL. This has been something that's been going on, I would say, since the early 2000s, where people said, you know, this COD... <coughs> I'm sorry, I woke up with a bit of a cough. This is the worst day for this, but... Um, in the early 2000s, people said, well, you know, this relational model and SQL, this is like something that's old and we don't really like it and we, we should do something else. And actually, there's an interesting historical reason for it. Um, and this, this is the reason. Anybody recognize what that is? Yes? I'm sorry? I didn't hear that. Hardware X, yes, but which specific hardware X? <laughs> Google's, who said that? Very good, you get, you get a free T-shirt from me. Um, <laughs> Um, so basically, this is a picture of one of the earliest Google racks. 
Okay, and, and, and it's, it has a lot going on in this picture, so let's unpack it a bit together. So they decided that um, they needed basically a lot of storage and compute because they just invented like the web search kind of problem and they had to put this web index somewhere and also they didn't have any money. Like, hard to imagine these days, but they didn't have any money. So they went to the nearest sort of, you know, media market or whatever they have over there. I think Fry's it's called. It's true. <laughs> went to the nearest uh, big, big sort of big box electronic stores and bought a bunch of very cheap computers. And they thought, well, you know, it's really it costs money to put them in racks. So we'll just put them on this, on the bare metal. Uh, here you can see the bare metal of the sort of the shelves. And, but this is problematic because it will short out, right? Like there will be some sort of electronics issue if you put the, you know, the main board directly on the shelf. So let's just take a piece of cardboard and put it, you know, you can see the cardboard here, it's really. And then let's just put the hard disks on top of another piece of cardboard that we just stack on the CPU and the RAM and everything there, right? It's, it's, it's pretty terrible. Um, <laughs> The, uh, well, this is, I, I just like showing it because now they, they, they pretend they're like, they've always been clever and whatever, but this is, anyways, um, so uh, <laughs> the thing is, why am I showing this? Why, what, how does this pertain to data systems? Well, they had a very non-standard use case in the late 90s. They had to deal with this web index without any money. Um, they needed to, they, they were absolutely imperative to take advantage of economies of scale and back then, that me, back then that means you buy a lot of cheap PCs from, you know, MediaMarkt. Um, and, but you had a lot of them. And suddenly you needed to somehow make all this sort of zoo of computers that you had work together. Okay? So this is a trick. This is a tricky thing. Like, in, if you ever worked with distributed systems, you know that this is not a fun thing. Um, these people, these, these machines, they keep dying on you. I mean, maybe they die because you put them on the cardboard, but that's... Um, but of course, the statistics just dictates once you have enough computers, one will die every minute or so. So they needed to deal with this web index, a big data problem. Aha, I said the word. Um, and with, with these kind of crappy machines, because they just couldn't go to IBM and pay them a billion dollars to buy, to get like a big cluster made. So that's when then the Google people um, invented MapReduce, right? So basically they said, this, let's give up the relational model. Let's give up the query language, SQL. Um, instead, we will put everything on these kind of cheap clusters of hardware where uh, we have many, many of them, hundreds and thousands. Um, and we'll, instead of offering a declarative query language, what does this mean? Instead of offering a query language that where people basically say, what they want, not how they wanted to compute. They went the entire other direction. And I said, no, actually what we're going to do is that you're going to express your data problem in terms of MapReduce jobs. Is anyone here in the room that had to do this? OK, there's a few people. Yeah. I don't have enough t-shirts, but you, you definitely deserve one. Because <clears throat> the point is that it's extremely difficult to translate any problem into MapReduce job. Why, why do we do this? Well, again, you only do this if this is all the hardware that you have. Um, so basically, 2006, the NoSQL people said, well, forget declarative query languages, forget relations, but it will scale, right? This is like the, the war cry, it will scale. And then this was great for about four years. Uh, <laughs> uh, so after four years, people were like, no, really, you have to, seriously, we cannot do this. Um, there is, I, I have done this myself, and there's really, I, and, and I've really struggled badly. There's not many people that can take complex analytical problems and turn them into a sequence of MapReduce jobs with any efficiency, right? Like there's, there's just not enough of them. And so it turns out that after about four years, the Hive project, I think it originally came out of Yahoo, if I'm not mistaken, they. Um, basically uh, said, we'll, 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 we'll have SQL again, okay? Let's, let's bring back SQL. This, it, it, it wasn't such a terrible idea after all. We'll, um, we'll basically retrofit SQL on top of this MapReduce system by having a clever query compiler. Huh? Much easier to have a clever query compiler and not, com and not people, because 
you need one clever person to build a query compiler, and then everyone can use it, as opposed to needing thousands of clever people that make MapReduce jobs. So that's kind of funny how that happened. Um, there's also been, <laughs> this is also super tragic, in, in this area, era, like starting from 2002 or so, there have been hundreds of scientific papers but that translated some scientific data problem into MapReduce jobs because that was the way that you got a paper back then. But then they were all essentially redundant because you could, you could write uh, SQL again with things like Hive and later Spark. Right? If you use Spark or Databricks today, that's one of the systems that was built to bring back um, declarative complex queries like SQL to, 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 these, to this world. But I'm not done, not done by far. 2009. Um, we, the people said, well, you know, this relational model, it's, it's too rigid. Like, we cannot have, we cannot have a schema. Schemas are, schemas are for old people. <laughs> and why don't we have a schema? Well, for scale, right? Because if we don't have a schema, then everything is kind of, like, every, anything goes, and kind of the, the application developer can deal with things like, uh, you know, reconciling the schema. You just do it in post. Let's do the schema in the application. It's fine. Um, yeah, so, and, and I think a system that um, is well known for doing this is MongoDB, there's others. I'm not, I'm not picking specific systems to make anyone angry, right? If MongoDB is in the room, please, you know, don't leave my bike alone, it's, it's not. Um, but, so, even though all these JSON documents you put in this, in this, in this, in this uh, MongoDB were all the same, you still were like, no, we don't have a schema. Well, <clears throat> I'm happy to report that back in 2017, uh, MongoDB finally cracked and added schema validation back to MongoDB, which is uh, fun to see when that happens, because it turns out application developers have, are really struggling with, with doing schema in an app, right? And they're, they, 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 they're not doing that. They should not be having to you know, deal with schema upgrades in their front-end code. That just doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, next, 2008, we had Cassandra, uh, so, in, so to explain what is Cassandra, it's a distributed key value store, so again, many computers. Um, and they, were, they, they, didn't, they didn't really destroy anything that we hadn't destroyed yet, but they destroyed the asset principles. Now, for those people who are not um, you know, enthusiasts of the Amsterdam nightlife, uh, what are asset transactions? <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, is uh, the idea that there are certain guarantees that your data system gives you. Like, once you've written something, I can read it back. Um, once, I've, once you've written something and I have told you it's written, I will never lose it again. Um, you can have two different processes writing to your data system at the same time, and they don't interfere with each other like in horrible ways. Again, you know, it's really important if you move money from A to B. Cassandra was like, no, this is difficult. Um, We'll, we'll forget about these transactions, and instead the application developer can deal with eventual consistency. What a horrible term. If eventual consistency in the application code, because, again, you know, they, they've already made them deal with the query language, uh, or lack thereof, we've already made them deal with the lack of schema. Now let's have them deal with eventual consistency as well. For scale, because then, you know, no asset means we can essentially, you know, have many nodes and they don't have to really talk to each other. Well, <clears throat> only... It, it took them a long time, but 2023, they, um, they ended up sub uh, adding support for Asset because, again, as it turns out, having uh, the app developers do this was a terrible idea. I have one more. Do you want one more? <laughs> okay. Um, it's actually quite up to date. Uh, so in case you have followed the last couple of uh, weeks of uh, the, the, the popular acquisition game with Tabular and Iceberg, this is really... It's really up to date. So in 2014, Spark uh, and uh, subsequently the company Databricks uh, were like, yeah, let's build a data system, but this concept of the data system owning the storage is kind of bad. Um, let's not have storage in our data system. Instead, it's up to you, our you know, beloved application developer that we let, already let do a lot of things. But it's now also up to you to deal with storage, which means that you get to I don't know, configure S3 buckets, and we put Parquet files on these S3 buckets, and then all is really, all, everybody was really happy, um, except if you had to change the data somehow, then things became a bit wonky. And again, our poor application developer then had to deal with inventing a storage strategy to deal with updates, deletes, schema evolution, and all that stuff, right? So that was 
um, another one of these things that I think I'll still count as uh, NoSQL giving up. But thankfully, uh, just uh, the last couple of weeks, I think it was just the last two weeks, and now people could claim I knew about this because I made the slides before the acquisition. Uh, I didn't. But um, basically what happened is that both Databricks and Snowflake went back and, in, and brought back internal storage or some variant thereof because it turns out you don't want your application developer uh, to deal with these things. So this is all very good. Uh, what, what, what can we learn, right? Let's, let's go to what can we learn from this. Well, I'd like to bring back the, uh, the tablet uh, from, from 5,000 years ago. So tables are older than literature. I mentioned this, right? Um, they're kind of eternal. They're, they're, they're very, the tables were there before our civilization, and they will be there after our civilization. So there's this holy trifecta, I want to call it. It's tables, SQL, acid, okay? You can all say this with me. Tables, <laughs> SQL, acid. Very good, now we're in church. Um, which is this holy trifecta of things that you can put together and make actually quite successful data systems with. Because the alternative is to have app developers do this themselves. And I think, as I tried to point out, having app developers do this themselves is really not a great idea. Coming back to the history lesson, Postgres, right? It is the world's most sort of popular data system at the moment. It's becoming the Linux of data, which is really impressive, given that it had these sort of interesting operating sort of birth at, uh, at Berkeley uh, uh, with Stonebreaker Group, where it was actually built as a sort of prototype, academic prototype for an object-oriented database, is something people have long forgotten, thankfully so. Um, and, but it evolved, and it's, it's really excellent. It's not perfect, but it's really good enough in most cases. Nobody's going to get fired for buying Postgres, right? And the good thing is it also is kind of free. Um, there's a ton of innovation inside and around, and it's really impressive um, that it started in 93. I looked this up. Uh, Linux itself started in 1991, so maybe that was something in the water in the 90s. Uh, that, that made people make sort of eternal data systems. But Postgres gets this, this trifecta right, right? They have tables, SQL, asset. Not much more, but they have that. Another system, SQLite. Tables, SQL transactions. SQLite has this too. Um, you may not know this, but SQLite is the world's most deployed data management system with over a trillion active databases at the moment. And how did it get to this number? Well, you currently have like 10 of them running in your phone or something like that, right? Um, and you don't even know. Again, you know, fundamental technology, you don't even know about it. Um, it's a tiny system. SQLite is developed essentially by one person, Dr. Richard Hipp. And he has some people around him at this point, but it's really impressive. And why is it so successful? Um, well, again, I think it gets the holy trifecta right. And it's, uh, yeah, so this is one of these things that came out of this long and sort of convoluted pro birth process of relational systems that we now have both these transactional systems, by the way, that um, are just b back to the basics, essentially. And it's, I think, especially interesting after this kind of 15 years of big confusion regarding whether this model should be given up or not. And people now say, hey, it's now new SQL. That's... Uh, that's, I think, people that say new SQL are the ones that have been yelling no SQL 10 years ago. <laughs> the, sort of the connoisseurs, they've been like, yeah, it's never, never went away, so what are you talking about? But uh, it's actually here to stay. So, so this, this, this short summary here is, I think, SQL is here to stay. But um, I'm, I'm going, I'm going I'm, I have lots of other things to talk about. Uh, how am I on time, by the way? 15. OK, great. So the first thing I want to talk about is the Actually, the data systems, the SQL systems, are grabbing more of the market share. We now went from ETL, where the data load was handled externally, to um, this happened, uh, happening inside um, the data system it ran with uh, the extract load transform. And this is seen a lot in the cloud databases, right? So this is super interesting. There have been, um, this is, if you want to look at history, like the current sort of state of things is where you will have a SQL system with tables and asset. It runs in the cloud. There's super interesting engineering from uh, Databricks, as I mentioned, from BigQuery, Snowflake, how to build native systems that run in the cloud. There's also interesting engineering from other people to ping, bring things like Postgres running in the cloud. It's all very nice. It's nothing specifically new. They still have tables and SQL and transactions. But you, this time, you have to put your credit card info. Sorry. 
<laughs> okay, so this was the history. Um, now I'd like to move on to bold predictions for the future. Okay? Because it's, it's, it's not, interesting to, in, not so interesting to, to sort of spend 45 minutes on, on, on history alone. I also want to see, like, make some predictions that maybe I'm right and I can point to the YouTube video in 20 years and say I told you so. So one of, the th one of my theses that I want to propose, because I'm also a professor, is that relational systems will eat everything. And this is a terrifying picture, but don't ask me. It's the AI that, uh, that did it. <laughs> relational eats everything. There's every year there's a new hype. There's 50 on 15 new system data systems appear. They get absorbed into Oracle after five years. It's great for VCs. It's great for the founders, if you're one of the winning ones. But it's not, it's not particularly interesting. Let me just, first of all, get the bu bucket of bad out of the way. Like, I'm not even going to go into these technologies. They, they should just, you know, go away again. And um, I'm not going to, I'm just going to call them the bucket of bad and, and, and move on with my life. These should not be eaten. But let's talk about things that relational can eat. The first thing is key value stores, right? We talked about some key value stores uh, before. Um, we had things like Mongo, the document stores, but key value stores like Cassandra have this, uh, have this abstraction that everything is, everything is sort of deconstructed in key and value pairs, um, where the key is a string in the abstract and the value is a string in the abstract. Now, if you think about how would a relational system represent a key value store, I, I'll give you a second to think about it, okay? How could we possibly represent key values in tables? Oh, it's there. Ah, um, so basically, this is the tr most trivial thing in the world, right? You just put it in a table. The thing is, if you can put it in a table, it's probably difficult to justify a separate system to exist for it, especially if the representation in a table is halfway efficient. This is beautiful. Put this in SQLite, put an index on the key, it's going to be as good as any key value store that you have, especially when you consider things like transactions. Next one is a slight variation. So now, Okay, bear with me. <laughs> We're modifying our key value concept here. We still have the key, it's still a string. Um, but this time, and I know this is innovation worthy of like a billion dollar company, we'll put a JSON string in the value. And then you, the application developer, again get to deal with the JSON string and its wonderful things. Like this is MongoDB, right, like in one table. Again, if you can put it into a, in, into a in brain damagingly simple table, it's probably something that relational t uh, systems will eventually eat. Let's go, let's go on. Time series databases. People have said, well, time series are this crazy thing that we should build 20 new data systems for. And they have, and they're out there, and they're beautiful. Um, but again, if you can think of the problem in a way that uh, is just a trivial table, then it's really difficult to justify something else uh, existing, especially given the long-term cycles in that space. As I said, data systems are around for decades. Like, if something can be eaten by relational, it probably will and has. So time series. We've left string land. This is good. We still have a table with two columns. We have a timestamp. It's a complicated thing. I mean, timestamps, they, they, you, kind of, you have to kind of use the 64-bit value for that to do it properly. And then we have the measurements, which is usually a double. And then the complexity actually comes not from the representation, but from the query language you put on this. But turns out that SQL also has evolved in that. We have now pretty good window functions, and engines have evolved to actually uh, evaluate time series queries pretty efficiently, like we in DuckDB, for example, have very good as of join support. So you can kind of eat that use case too. And now it brings me to my latest and greatest uh, Vector databases, okay? So you, you probably saw this one coming. If we have, if the idea is to say, let's have a separate databases because embeddings as created by machine learning models are so fundamentally different, I need to get 200 million of VC money to start a new database company from scratch to deal with this novel and unprecedented kind of data. Well, again, it's just a table that now has as added complexity a list of fixed size as its value. And that's all there is to it. And so this is a problem that the relational systems, as I said, they will eat everything. Um, there is no reason to make a separate system if the representation in, in you know, 5,000-year-old tables is trivial. And actually, I'm absolutely right about this because 
Oracle just a month ago has announced now that their vector extension for Oracle is GA, and if I were working at a vector database company, I would be a bit worried at this point. I have one more. <laughs> so people have also said we should make our own graph databases. But that's also, I mean, you can see from my table construction here that it's getting a little bit more complicated, but it's really not. Like, we have two tables, and this is because we're being generous and allow properties. Um, we have two tables, one for nodes and one for edges, and again, any sort of specialized system for graphs, graphs has ended up not being better than general purpose systems. And also, not so long ago, uh, when was this? 2023. Um, the ISO has standard, standardized uh, SQL PGQ, which is essentially graph stuff for SQL. And again, it will not be long until the Oracle uh, people have announced GA. And again, I'm not, I'm not proposing yet. You all should switch to Oracle. I'm just saying maybe don't jump on the latest craze every single time because they tend to be eaten. Um, briefly mentioned data frames. This is also one of these things. It's a bit difficult because it's not a separate data model. Data frames, like people use in Python or R, they are tables. They're just called differently for some reason. And here we also see the same thing, where basically people have been writing their own table engines in Python or R, but then they are slowly being eaten by specialized relational systems that can run in these environments, like DuckDB or others. But basically, again, these engines are just so complicated to make that it's, there's no point in making a specialized one for your favorite data frame environment. Um, you want things like optimization, parallel execution, persistence, transactions, and so on and so forth. So data frames, my prediction, are going to become um, something that we talk about on an API level only like we do together uh, already with Spark. Now I'm getting to the thing where things become a little bit more difficult to eat for relational systems. Because I want to also show you where I think this ends, like this relational we will eat everything asterisk, right? So here we have text search, right? People have made text search en engines, like, you know, the one we mentioned earlier, Google. How does this work? Well, we build an inverted index, and then we query this index, and there's highly efficient code that deals with compression and intersection and all that stuff. And you can actually represent this as tables. And in fact, I'm, I'm guilty of writing a paper that describes how you can put a search in, search, uh, text search into a relational engine. But it, it's, it's a bit on the, f on the fence, I would say. Uh, the paper talked about this, how this is great for prototyping, and I still think it is. But text search is a little bit going away a bit from this world where everything can be trivially eaten by tables. And now the question is, what actually refuses to be eaten? Um, and I think it's really interesting. Many people have tried things like array data, um, pictures, movies, um, audio, this can be represented as tables, yes. Nothing keeps me from putting the matrix into a parquet file. However, is it a good idea? And the answer is no, right? You should leave that in, in a movie file. Um, so in general, the, what refuses to be eaten is data shapes that cannot be efficiently represented as tables. And I think, I think arrays like x, y coordinate things are one of these things. But I'm really curious to see what other sort of data shapes we see in the future uh, that will be refusing to re be eaten and what other data shapes will be popping up um, that, uh, how should I say, that will be absorbed by, by the relational people immediately. Okay, I have one more thing I want to talk about uh, in my last five minutes, uh, which is big data is dead. <laughs> and I, I really like the picture because it's, it's like... It's like a duck walking around graveyards of big stacks of data. I don't know. It's just sometimes it's really nice. Let's start with a little thought experiment. If I were to employ the entire working population of the Netherlands, it's about 10 million people, I will all make them type, you know, the entire entire year uh, on 200 characters a, se a minute. Uh, it's not a second; it's a minute. Um, we will produce something like 200 terabytes of data which with some compression becomes 60 terabytes. So now I've spent, you know, the GD, like basically the gross domestic product of this country to produce 60 terabytes of data, and that does fit on two disks. <laughs> it used to be three, but I looked this up again last week, and the hard disks has become, have become bigger. These are, uh, what is it? 32 terabyte disks. Who knew? 
And they're not really expensive either. They cost like 400 euros each. Big data. Um, yeah, and there's a banana for scale because of course there is. <laughs> it turns out going, going to like big distributed systems like we started with when Google first was around isn't that great of an idea anymore. And the first reason why that's not such a great idea anymore is because scalability comes at a great amount of cost. There's this wonderful paper that if you haven't read it, read it, you should. It's really fun. It's one of the more fun academic papers. And I use the term sparingly. That basically says once you start distributing a problem, uh, it becomes just so much harder that you're very often better off with a single computer. And at the same time, computers, single computers, have become crazy better. Like this is a picture of the M3 from Apple. It has 400 megabytes of cache. It has 400 gigabytes per second RAM throughput. It's insane, right? Like what, what a single node can do now is crazy. Similarly, SSDs, really game changer. They, uh, the current ones, the, the ones in the current MacBooks, which is like a laptop, right? Has something like five gigabytes per second in throughput. Like these numbers in the, in, on the Google computers in the 90s, we were lucky if we got 50 megabytes a second from a hard disk. And now we get 5.5 gigabytes per second. Pretty crazy. Um, just going to skip something here in the interest of time. But I'm going to show this. <laughs> so basically, what happens if we are not, if we are sort of distributing things without good reasons, we get these giant data centers that are filled with things that are doing things that are not really necessary. And so this is really something I think that we should be more aware of in, in, in computing, is that we should be putting distributed systems because they're so in, in, into, into action when we don't have to, because they're so damn inefficient, right? Like, I look at this thing every day from my office, and I really don't like the view. It looks like the combines have finally arrived. Um, and, 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 and it pains me to think about that so many of these systems that are sitting there are just running some sort of ancient piece of software that refused to be sort of updated to run on a single computer. I'm going to show you one experiment. I can't have a t talk about databases without experiments. So I'm going to run a standard benchmark, TPCH, which is a standards body for benchmarks. Scale factor 100, which means about 40 gigabytes of compressed data. Biggest table has like 600 million rows. And I'm running a benchmark on an AWS machine that has 32 cores and 64 gigabyte of RAM. It's not crazy big, it's not tiny, good size. And then if we run this benchmark on this machine with both DuckDB and Spark on EMR, which is like the Amazon distributed thing, it turns out that DuckDB is seven times better on, seven, on a single machine. Now you would say, well, yes, you're an idiot. This is a scale-out system, so clearly it will be better when you add more nodes. Yes, this is true. <laughs> but even if we add 32 computers to this problem and a th over 1,000 CPU cores versus the 32 we started with, it will still be slower. And why is that? Well, it comes back to this cost paper that basically says, well, once you distribute something, it doesn't get faster necessarily. So that's kind of what I want to leave you with, with this idea that we're going back to single node as a bold prediction. And that brings me to my <laughs> summary. Um, well, I try to give you a short summary of the last decades of data management. Um, I try to argue that tables are eternal. And I'm, actually, I'm not, you know, I'm not the one that ought to argue. History will show whether they are, but I think they are. Um, I'm not going to make many friends by, in, the, in the MongoDB sort of community by saying no, SQL was a really bad idea. Um, because relational systems have these properties, you know, SQL, tables, transactions, that, that will just make, which are kind of inevitable if you make data management systems. Um, relational systems, also I want to sh put the point out that they will eat most things in terms of like, uh, you know, like if, you, if, if your problem can be reduced to a two-column table, it's probably something that they will eat. Um, and then, Briefly, in the last couple of minutes, I was trying to argue that big data is dead. But I'm happy to continue the discussion. I'll be around, and I'm happy to take questions. So thank you.